all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. This episode of Marketing Today was taped at Brand Marketing Summit back in May in San Francisco, where I moderated a panel on how to future-proof your brand in a constantly evolving landscape. My panelists were Margaret Kwan, Director of Customer Marketing Strategy at eBay, and Valerie Wynn, Partner Co-Head of Strategy at Wolf and Willamine out of New York. The panel really took on this subject of future proofing. And, you know, if you think about it, in a world where big brands are apologizing and taking stands, how can you future proof your brand? We use some experience, case studies, and examples to explore what people are doing, as well as practical tips for how to internally and externally manage your brand for the future. I hope you enjoy this episode of Marketing Today. I'm here to moderate a panel about a work that stands the test of time, how to future-proof your brand in a constantly evolving landscape. And we've got a treat today. We've got two amazing minds here on stage with Margaret and Valerie. So I'd love for them to just introduce themselves to you. Margaret? Sure. My name is Margaret Kwan, and I'm currently the Director of Customer Marketing Strategy at eBay. So eBay is a platform where we have buyers and sellers, so I lead customer strategy for our selling side, getting people to sell on our platform. And my history is over 20 years of consumer marketing. I started off as an engineer, as a management consultant. Then I went into traditional CPG marketing, did a stint internationally, and spent some time at an e-commerce platform, and also worked with some retailers. So have a range of (coughs) consumer marketing background. So that's me. Cool. And I'm Valerie Wynn. I'm a founding partner and co-head of strategy at Wolf & Wilhelmina. We're a brand strategy consultancy based in New York City, and we help brands big and small essentially define and then operationalize their why and their how, so their purpose and also their story. Great. Thank you. So it's a historic time. If you look on the airways today, we've got three big brands doing apologies, Uber, Wells Fargo, Facebook. We've got other brands that are being boycotted, some brands that are taking a stand. It's definitely a tumultuous time to be a brand leader. What does it mean to both of you to future-proof your brand? And maybe we can start with Valerie. Yeah, so, you know, the future is really bright until you're caught in its headlights. And we've heard a lot today about how, you know, the marketplace is just so dynamic. And if you're going to keep up, you can't just react to the market. You actually have to have an instinct in the market. And so, We, you know, at W&W, we're focused on what we call building brand instinct. And what that really means is you have this deep in your bones understanding across the entire organization of what is right and what is wrong for your brand. And a lot of people call that brand strategy. And at the core of, you know, this brand instinct is, again, like I said earlier, it's this purpose. And it is this internal and external rallying focal point where that creates not only the coherence in everything you do, but it creates a connection place, a connection with consumers. It creates a connection with culture. And those are the things that can't be commoditized. And to go back to the other point about it being internal as well, is that you can't just create an amazing purpose, right? You also have to operationalize it. You can have a beautiful, pretty deck, that you present and it has, you know, great stock photography. But if you don't have the policies in in the infrastructure in place to actually operationalize that, then you're not really going to get anywhere. And what is important in operationalizing your purposes, so many brands have purposes that essentially amount to a lot of vanilla. It amounts to, they're all, you know, at the beauty pageant saying that they believe in world peace, which is cute, but it doesn't actually mean anything. To get to a really powerful purpose, you have to build with the tension and the truth and the bravery of who you are and also who you aren't. It's okay if your purpose doesn't resonate with every single person. It's okay if actually you're not a brand for them, right? You will have the people that are connecting to your brand in a real way. And that's so much more meaningful. Yeah. And I would add to that, you know, great, like summary of that. And so many times Alan and I both have young daughters and we were talking about how it's so easy to get distracted both as consumers, but also as brands these days. 
So, you know, my daughter plays on a soccer team and the ball goes here and the whole team runs there and the ball goes here and they all go there. You know, it's, there's no focus because there's seven. But I also see, I see brands doing that. And as Val said, like, in order for a brand to really have good long-term value and strength, you really, really need to know what your instinct or your purpose is. And you need to make sure it's constantly in touch with what's happening in, in the marketplace and be able to flex because it means that sometimes you have to pivot a little on how you express it but the core has to stay true there. And I think that's what you know we're saying is that, like my daughter's soccer team, that core is constantly changing. That doesn't work. But as a brand, if you have your core really solid and consistent, but different expressions of it, like that's what you need to do to flex with the change of times. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some examples. So, Margaret, we were talking about an example of failure, although we've also seen the resurrection here while we've been here. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so maybe you give that example and then we can go. Sure. Yeah. Alan and I were chatting as we were preparing for this. And he's like, what's a brand that you think kind of like didn't pivot with the times? And the example I shared is I didn't realize they were on the agenda. It was, it was of Kodak, actually. And I shared it because I love photography. I've always been into photography. And I'm one of those hardcore like geeks when I was a kid that took pictures. And I went to Costco to buy the multi-pack of the film, you know, because it was cheaper. And, you know, I always take pictures. And I remember when the digital camera came out and it just getting so much traction pretty quickly and all these smaller brands launching and Kodak was really adamant about staying with film. And it was pretty obvious a year in that people were moving towards digital, but Kodak didn't really shift because they were trying to stay core to what they believed was core, which was film. And they didn't realize that their core was actually memories, which is what the speaker spoke about yesterday's. And again, that's where like, that was an example where I feel like their core really was memories and memory preservation. They probably got a little distracted through the years and thinking it was film, the physical presence, versus the actual meaning and essence or instinct of what you stand for. And so I, as Alan and I were preparing for this, I said that was an example in my mind of where they didn't shift and focus. You know, Alan asked about eBay. So I work at eBay now, and eBay is another great example. So we've been around since 1995. And I'd say if I asked most people, what does eBay stand for? Some of the things that pop to mind first are auction house, garage sale, used stuff, not all sexy things. And, you know, the reality is that is how we started. So Pierre, who is our founder, it, he started the company literally selling a broken pointer to someone else on the web. And so our heritage and roots was selling things. But it, what we needed to realize that was that as we were growing and as the marketplace space was growing, we couldn't stay just in pre-owned items. We needed to expand our assortment. So one of the things that eBay did was to make sure we expanded, expanded our assortment to meet the demands of what buyers were looking for. So, you know, we started expanding into working with different entrepreneurs, merchants, large merchants who sold new items as well. And if you look across our platform today, approximately 80% of things sold are actually new items. So we still have the range of pre-owned, unique, you know, collectible and new, but about 80% of what we sell is, is new, which reflects how eBay had to pivot to be relevant long-term. Interesting. So yeah. Valerie, you've got a couple of examples as well. And one is your own company and about how you're evolving post-founder. Yeah, so we are about five years old and recently our founder left. And that can be a really traumatic, hard thing for a company to go through. Any company, whether you're a startup or not, when the leadership leaves, things get kind of scary because it's like, oh, where are we going, right? But we actually practice what we preach, and we've built a really strong brand purpose at the core of our company. And that's do great work, live great lives. A lot of what we were built around, we wanted to you know, do the amazing work of brand strategy and advertising, but not under the soul-crushing sometimes conditions that often occur in New York ad agencies. It can feel a little bit like a sweatshop. But because we were able to build such a strong purpose that didn't just live in our founder, but lived in every single person at the company, when she left, it wasn't like you know, the table was flipped on us. We were continued to you know, operate as usual because the brand was so much more than any one person. And I think you can see examples of brands when you are built on one person, when that person leaves, or when, that, when news comes out about that person that is less than ideal, your company can very much get dragged down with it. And then another fun example that I love to bring up, especially, Margaret, you mentioned the need to stay close to your customers. We worked with a company called Bonobos. It was about 
It was in 2015, and they are an online men's clothing brand. And we came in when they'd, they'd gotten their feet under them. They had a great pants, y'all. Everyone should buy some <laughs> Bonobos pants. But, you know, that was kind of it. And so we came in to build brand strategy to give them the foundation to scale up and take it to the next level. And we started with men. And we got really deep into men's closets, which was a little scary at times. But we also dug deep into understanding them as people, understanding their hopes and their dreams and their fears. And, you know, back then, masculinity wasn't the hot, cool, cultural topic that it is right now. And even right now, I think it's still kind of bubbling up. It's not really fully in the forefront of conversation the way that gender or that feminism is in the conversation. But... What was most important and to make sure that they're not just running around the soccer field chasing after errant soccer balls, there was a really true and resonant connection between the DNA of the brand and this cultural opportunity. So we built Bonobos' brand purpose and their instinct around this idea of evolving masculinity. And we rolled it out to everybody in the organization. So often it's like, oh, the marketing department all gets together and they get the presentation and that's it. We rolled it out to everyone and Actually, in fact, somebody who worked in their finance department who sat in one of our workshops just wrapped up a stint with us because he's decided to make the transition to brand strategy off of that. But just goes to show that, you know, that the brand doesn't just belong to the marketing department. It doesn't just belong to the CEO. The brand belongs to every person at the organization. And that's actually a really empowering, exciting thing for people. Everyone wants to feel like they're a part of something bigger. And that's how that brand instinct can help drive a company forward. It was funny, another example, we were talking over lunch yesterday about this, and I worked at Clorox for six years, and one of the brands I managed was Brita. And you know, sharing a, an example of how we need to make sure that not only does the brand stand for something, but employees believe and understand it. We did a bunch of market research to understand our hardcore Brita consumers you know, why they love Brita. And our insight was that these people are people who believe that drinking water is really healthy for them. They drink eight to 10 glasses of water a day and they do it because it makes them feel good. And so when we had one of my team meetings, I asked like, how much water do you guys drink? And this is, you know, I worked there 20 years ago, almost 15, 20 years ago. And so soda was still quite popular. And so a lot of my colleagues are drinking soda. And I was like, you know, we're going to start a little competition, which is, hey, we need to really live and breathe our brand. I said, for the next two weeks, everybody in this room has to drink eight to 10 glasses of water a day. So we started this little like competition in the office where everyone, there was a board and you had to pick off when you drank water. So we kind of <laughs> monitored each other. The first thing was we had a lot of bathroom breaks. So that changed the culture a little bit. But pretty quickly we realized, or all the employees realized that actually drinking water did make them feel better. And it was really impactful for me to see that just from a two-week experiment of forcing people to drink eight to 10 glasses of water a day, like people understood the brand more. Like, they understood why our core consumers were so loyal to Brita. So, I mean, that's just an, an example of a small tactic we did that helped our team understand, live, and breathe the brand of what we were trying to say in the marketplace. So It's interesting, as I hear both of you guys talk, the work started internal almost mm -hmm. in every example. Yes. And it reminds me of the chart the CMO of Farmers put up yesterday, the iceberg, right? Mm -hmm. With yeah. all of that base under the water that you don't see. And the little bit that pokes up above the water is what we all see in the marketplace as consumers. So, Valerie, I don't know, can you speak to a little bit maybe more about, like, the internal? Like, how, yeah. And how much you focus on that? Yeah. So, you know, to go back to that idea of a lot of agencies being really hard places to work at, you know, when we started, we're like, oh, great. Like, we're here. We're all about work-life balance. Like, everyone should just be doing that, right? And what we found was that, we all came up through, you know, New York advertising culture and everyone was wanting to be on their emails all the time. Nobody wanted to take blackout vacations. Nobody wanted to, you know, shut off and go and live the great lives and go to the museums and do all the great stuff that actually at the end of the day makes the work amazing. And so what we had to do was we had to actually write into the scopes of work with our clients that we don't do emails after seven o'clock or on the weekends. And yes, if there is a marketing emergency you can call us. There tends to not be very many marketing emergencies for real. But by, you know, having that really visible and hard kind of guideline really helps people to say, oh, wait, because you have to build kind of the ladders for people to be able to make those behavioral changes, especially when you're trying to create a purpose that permeates everything you do from the external, the tip of the iceberg, all the way down to 
you know, your performance evaluations, who you hire, how you hire, how you incentivize, all of those things have to line up because, you know, the digital revolution kicked the doors in and now companies are very much responsible for matching their internal operations with those external communications. And the world is waiting to call BS on you. And so by, you know, using brand purpose, you can start to make sure that everything is aligned and that also at the end of the day, it's more efficient, right? If everything's driving towards the same purpose, you're not wasting energy running around the soccer field. Yeah. <laughs> well, so let's talk a little bit about the external environment and taking stands. I was mm-hmm. with a consumer packaged goods brand last week, I'll protect the innocent, but they're known for taking stands, but that's been a few years and they've kind of, they're trying to figure out where do I focus now? How do I maintain that cultural relevance in today's world, which is even more, I think, contentious. You know, how do you guys think about that, you know, in terms of brands taking a stand and any examples that come to mind? Yeah, you know? you know, it's a sticky subject. It's really hard to know when you would take a stand as a brand. It's, it's similar to us as people, like when do you want to stand for something? And my advice and my guidance is you take a stand when it's the right thing to do and if it's aligned with your brand and what you stand for. An example is actually at, at eBay. So we don't own anything. You know, we are a platform. We are a platform and a marketplace for individuals, businesses to come sell on our platform and then for buyers to come buy. And with that, like we stand for our community. If it wasn't for the community, we wouldn't exist because, again, we don't own inventory. We don't sell. We're a marketplace. And so something that's real time happening now is it's a Supreme Court case. It's South Dakota versus Wayfair. I don't know how many of you guys have been listening to that, but it's in 1992, the Supreme Court had a precedent that states could not tax individual sellers or small businesses who didn't have physical presence in their state. And that's actually being challenged right now in the Supreme Court. So eBay is actively standing for that or against the overhaul, right, Mm -hmm. which is We've taken an active stand. We had people go to D.C. We worked with our seller community to get petitions signed, encouraged our sellers to talk to their local governments to reiterate the importance of not changing that because if states start to tax anyone who sells on the Internet, that would significantly hurt our entrepreneurs and small businesses whose livelihoods depend on the ability to reach people outside of the local areas, and that's what eBay does. So in that case, it really was aligned, or this case that's out there is really aligned with our DNA of what we do and who we stand for. And so in that case, I think we should stand up. So my advice and point is like, when there are political situations, if it's aligned with what you stand for, you know, just like as individuals, you should stand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think so many of the, you know, social institutions that as a society we've relied on to give us direction and to take stands, a lot of the, you know, People don't go to church like they used to. A lot of these power structures have crumbled. So, you know, to remain relevant as a brand, you do need to take an active role in creating the future. If you're too busy, like, worrying about keeping up, like, you're already behind. So if you want to future-proof, you actually have to think about future creation. But with that comes such a responsibility to do that with integrity. You know, we've been talking a lot about all these examples of people messing things up. And, you know, the thing that I think you have to remember is one, to your point, keeping it aligned with who you stand for as a brand and your heritage and your DNA and avoiding being what I like to call a culture vulture. And that's that, you know, trend chasing, oh, I'm just going to hop onto the latest thing because it's the latest thing without any real intention around it. Because to participate in these cultural spaces where the future is being created you have to act with an integrity that I think comes down to three things, one of which is community. So are you playing by the rules of the community that is already creating in that space? Are you embracing the community? Are you hiring the community? So many brands are like, oh my gosh, like how am I going to know how to connect with so-and-so? I'm like, well, have you hired (laughs) anybody from that community? Because that's the number one step, right? Bring them into the table. The other thing is giving credit. Like there will always be, especially in these spaces like gender and feminism, where like people are on the streets, in the trenches, like doing the hard work. So giving them the credit and elevating them and championing them. And I think the last thing is coin, right? So put your money where your mouth is. Are you willing to either contribute financially or take a hit on the back end in terms of You know, I think Patagonia is one. I was doing some groups with a bunch of teenagers and college kids, and they were just in awe of Patagonia because they're like, oh, they did that thing where it's like, don't buy this jacket. And that meant they're just losing so much money. And like, 
in my head, I'm like, yeah, they're probably earning a lot of that back in marketing. But, you know, it goes to show that, you know, people are looking for that commitment. And that's part of what is necessary when you want to um, participate in the future. That's great. We've got a few questions piling up here. So let's take the first one. What advice would you give for big institutional brands in a future that seems to be about small, non-institutional brands? Yeah, so I think this is actually really interesting. I think there's a bit of like a judo move you can do with this and that um, people are expecting the cool East and West coastal elitist brands to the small ones to be out there, you know, throwing the punches and pushing forward. But I think we're in the midst of a really interesting conversation right now, especially in light of the election where it's like there's a whole big chunk in middle of the country that is very, very much relevant and just as important as these bleeding edge coasts. So when you're a bigger company, you actually have the reach and the power and the salience so that when you do something, it means so much more. People are expecting, you know, milk makeup, a tiny little New York brand to, you know, go out and do the crazy things. But if you're a big brand like Walmart and you are taking a stand in a certain way, that's actually going to be a lot more salient and interesting than a tiny little startup somewhere. So, I mean, there's pros and cons to being on both sides of that, but there is power in that. I think that gets ignored. Yeah, I would say having come from mostly institutional big brands, I would say you really need to lean into your strength. So you're absolutely right. There are little startups and pop-ups coming up everywhere, and some of them are really cool and hip. And it's a little bit like my daughter's soccer team, right? So as new things come, consumers will try. And it's great. And like, I love competition because we were talking about like competition actually creates greatness in the marketplace. As an institutional brand, you have to realize when you're in the face of all these small startups or all these cooler brands coming up, like you need to really focus on yourself and know like what is your reason for being and why are you different and then lean into that. An example I can share is when I worked at Clorox, I did a rotation in our sales group and I was our marketing lead for sales for our club channel. So Costco was one of my clients and they were amazing. They stand for doing the right thing for their members and they do it because I think it's like 90% of their profits or something comes from membership. So for them, it's mm. absolutely critical that's public data, so I can share that. I mean, it's critical for them to do the right thing for their members because all their profits come from their members. And so they literally will fight with manufacturers trying to sell in products or not to make sure they get the best price and they pass it all down to their members. And they do that because they realize how important it is for them. So a lot of those members, there's lots of other online places where people can order or buy or shop you know, obviously, just like anyone, they have competition. But how Costco has protected and saved their space as a bigger institutional brand is they've really, really leaned into, and they continue to, over time, lean into what they stand for, what they believe in. And, you know, most people will say they fully trust what Costco has done for them because over all these years, they've built this reputation and truth that their employees stand for and fight for their members. So, so again, just really sticking true to what you stand for and making sure you lean into that and not be my daughter's soccer team and run after the coolest next trend. Nice. The next question is, do you have suggestions for a company with a long history that needs to evolve culture to stay relevant? How can you help shift be embraced internally? Well, yeah. you know, it's funny, it's GoDaddy. So I don't know if, how many of you guys heard the GoDaddy presentation. I must say the, the woman who spoke, I respected the fact that she was, was able to stand up for that because that's a hard one. Like as a woman, when I saw those ads and I remembered some of them from before, but not some of the early, early ones. They had a pretty hard position where they were at, especially in today's society. So, you know, advice on, on how to change, like you got to be bold and make that move. Like if you know you're going down the wrong path, you know, GoDaddy, they knew they were going down the wrong path. They were alienating people. They were offending people. And so they made a pretty hard decision to move. I think, you know, I felt like there's probably more room there and there's a, that's an evolution. But if, you know, you're in a bad and tough situation, and there's only kind of downhill there. I think you just need to figure out as an executive team, like when do you rip the Band-Aid off and make that pivot? Mm -hmm. And like I said, GoDaddy, it sounds like they have started that. And, you know, that's respectful because that's not easy. Yeah. And I think, you know, change is something that is so multifaceted. It's very easy to get caught up in the top-down elements of cultural change, especially within companies when you know, we all operate kind of in this cult of leadership, right? Like we all sit around and read HBR articles about how to be better <laughs> leaders. And that is important. But I think that especially as more women become leaders, you know, that is becoming more multifaceted. And so when you're thinking about how to create change, 
are you thinking about bottom-up change? Are you thinking about lateral change? Are you thinking about how do you build the systems that constantly give the little nudges, right? Because at the end of the day, culture is just an amalgamation of routines. And so those are your daily things. So if you can incorporate daily drinking more water to better connect with your customer, like those are the things that actually make an impact. And so by building those small nudges and also building them out over time, like people can't take everything in in one offsite. They just can't. (laughs) As much as I would love as somebody who designs offsites to think, you know, okay, they're going to take it all in. Like that's just not true, right? So by building it out over time and with a lot of emotion, that's how you get things to stick. But actually that's a good point. Like so not only in the GoDaddy example, like not only do you have to make as an executive team the hard decision to actually pivot, you have to implement things to facilitate that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. your company example of like no emails after seven on, or on weekends, the Brita example of forcing my team to drink water. I mean, those are all like silly things, but like they are hard, tangible things that we force internally to help make that evolution. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, especially with company values, oftentimes don't, those don't have the teeth of actual policies yeah. to make sure that they're real, right? Yeah. And again, they're just something that's beautifully painted on a wall somewhere in the cafeteria. Yeah. The next question is, I think, targeted to you, Val. So uh, brand instinct sounds great in theory, Mm -hmm. but how hard is it to execute in practice? So, I mean, it is hard, right? I'm not going to pretend like we just come in and we show you the deck and then you're good to go, right? To commit to brand instinct requires hard work. And even to get there, to get to that sharp purpose requires a lot of looking in the mirror and being very real about who you are and who you aren't, having the bravery to just own that. But then after that, are you going to stick to the hard line? Are you going to, based on that purpose, make the call that maybe won't make you popular, but is the right thing to do based on, you know, the purpose that you're building? So we always say that sometimes at the beginning, you have to you know, brands do well with dictators in that there is somebody who's like, nope, that is not how we do things anymore. Or yes, that is how we do things. And that sharpness, like eventually it just becomes natural, right? Like at Google, they talk about like, is that Googly or not? And when you first start, there's a kind of a moment where you're like, wait, what the hell are people talking about? But you know, over time you understand it, but you understand it through people being like, that's not Googly. So there's as much positive reinforcements as negative reinforcement, but it is it is a journey, but the benefits are well worth it because over time, people are able to own and run things. And I like to say decisions should always get easier with brand strategy, not harder. Yeah. Well, and to your point, it's got to be consistent too. So it, it is hard. Like having a brand instinct, having that like clear focus is super, super hard, but it's got to be made simple so that people get it. Like mm-hmm. to your point, like whatever this insight is or this instinct, it's got to be articulated in a way that people get it. And senior leadership has to constantly reiterate it. You know, actually, it made me think of an example of when I worked at Clorox, our CEO was amazing. He would say, do the right thing. And it was as simple as that consistently, every all hands. Every time we had a hard decision, he would say, do the right thing. And it was this essence of what we stood for, but it was simplified in a way so that everyone mm-hmm. could understand it. Yeah. And it was literally consistently reiterated at every all hands. And as things came up, we'd be like, is that doing it the right thing? You know, we were like, yeah. But it, it, it like trickled down through the organization so that we did, we were able to build that in. Yeah, and those stories. And like, yeah. you almost have to, you're building a belief system. So the myths that go along with whatever values and purpose you are standing for are also yeah. important. So like for us, you know, we will say no to clients. We will walk away from business sometimes very lucrative business because it doesn't align with our values. And especially when we're onboarding people or people are new to the company, those stories of like, wow, wait, so you said no to the working with them? It is, you know, it's that kind of just storytelling element that drives home and is something that people can remember and hold on to. I think we've got time probably for one more question. What tools or software you use to create and execute strategy? I know tools and software kind of a hard one, I think, in this space. But I know both of you love research Mm. and involving people in that process. So maybe we can talk about that. But if anything else jumps to mind, that'd be great too. I would say brand. So we use brand health trackers. Yeah. So that's maybe a tool there that you can say. So like (laughs) if you're trying to lean into a certain attribute and like you're trying to either change or keep one from moving, you know, a tool or a process we do is we'll research it. So we have regular brand health trackers 
where we go out on either monthly or quarterly basis and go to gen pop to certain audiences and their surveys to understand like consumer gen pop opinions about brands. And you look at that over time and that's a tool you can leverage to see like whether or not you're moving the needle mm-hmm. on a certain attribute, if that's the needle or the attribute of the strategy you're trying to drive. That would be something that you know I've used in my career. Yeah, so these aren't, well, actually, I would argue these are the ultimate tools. Um, <laughs> they're not software, but I think empathy and vulnerability are both really important tools and practices to building great brand strategy. On the empathy side, um, we always say to know you have to go. And it's really easy to say like, yeah, we got our junior, our intern, they're like on Instagram and like they're like figuring out what's happening with people. It's like, no. I did a project with Hurley around surfing. And like, I'm from Texas. Like, surfing is not something that I grew up with at all. And I had to go and figure out, you know, a culture and a community that has been very historically, you know, locals only, right? And there's no way that I could have done, you know, a couple of interviews with some surf guys or whatever and have understood it. What I had to do is I had to go and I had to sit in the sand with kids who were like, like, oh, hey, just like, yeah, meet me where the surf is good. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, I don't know where the surf is good. And I had to actually spend so much time, like, you know, sitting in the back of a car and they're like avoiding tolls. And I'm like, I guess this is a surfing lifestyle. (laughs) But, you know, I really had to know the community at that, you know, depth. And then I think also the other side of that is the battle is not just with connecting with people, but it's also connecting with what's happening inside your company and the vulnerability to do that and to really open up. I think it is not just like business, right? Like everyone spends so much time working. You know, these are big chunks of our lives. And so I have a, you know, secret count of how many people have cried in workshops, but it's because you have to get really vulnerable and you have to get really real and honest. And sometimes that comes with emotion and that's okay. Actually, I think when you're getting to a truth that is emotional, that is when your brand is powerful. Like your brand should be maybe not starting fights and bars, but they should be something that people get passionate about and people get fired up about. Well, thank you both. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but I'm sure they'll be around for anybody that didn't get their question answered. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K.com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me, with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, Social media support by Megan Woods. Art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to marketing today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.